It looks like we made it. We're at module seven of our Connect for Windows V2 Jump Start. If you're still with us, you've got stamina, you've got energy. Thanks for hanging in there. I'm Ben Lauer alongside Casey Meekoff. Hey guys. And uh, before we get into the session here, I gotta say, Vinayak Ganti. If you're watching this on the recording, this means nothing to you. If you're in the live event right now, Vinayak Ganti, you have been blowing it up in the in the chat window with questions. Thank you so much. Uh, you've been super active. And as a way to say thank you, I want to send you a custom Connect for Windows sensor bag. Nice. We just had a brand new run of these. We, they're coming in here in about a week. If you email us your shipping address and phone number, we are going to ship you one of these to say thanks. Again, you've been super awesome with all of your questions and all your inquisitiveness in the uh, chat in the questions. Now, to the rest of you that are now going and starting to fire off questions randomly right now, it's too late. Random thing just for Vignac, thank you. Email us at K, the number four, so K4W at Microsoft.com. Vignac, thanks. So let's get back on task here. Module seven, advanced That's right. topic, skeletal tracking and depth filtering. So again, I'm Ben Lauer. I'm a program manager and developer community manager here on the Connect team at Microsoft. And uh, Casey, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, hi, my name is Casey Meekoff. I'm a program manager uh, on the Connect platform team, uh, focused primarily in the areas of depth processing and also in skeleton tracking. Great, the floor is yours, man. That's it. All Can right. I forget something? Uh, is there anything else I need to you've say? You've got some speaker slides coming up. Uh, you know what? Okay, yeah, we can stuff. do the speaker slides. I mean, if I'll, you... I'll just talk to it. Let's go. Talk to it. Do it. All right. So cool. So um, thanks all for coming again. Thanks for watching my this talk here. Um, it's all about filtering the Connect. So we've got this fancy new sensor, as you know, that we're about to ship for real on Windows. Uh, and just one ship of the nice it today, things, by the way. That's great news, Ben. Actually, you know, you, it, it's, it, it's been so long. We've been saying about to, about to, about It's been coming. Yeah, it's today alpha, was the day. These beta. things are landing in 23 countries today. They're shipping. The public SDK uh, is available today. We're rocking. Yeah. Yeah. So the cool thing about these sensors is we actually had them around for a while as part of the Xbox One program. And in that time, we've been doing a lot of different kinds of experiments on top of them. Um, a lot of things that we did worked out pretty good. Uh, a lot of things turned into uh, great attempts at being pretty good. But either way, we learned a whole lot in the process. And the goal for this talk is to take some of those concepts and try to distill them into some practical advice that hopefully you can all use in your own applications to make your own experiences uh, as good as they can be. Uh, this was the speaker slide. You already talked about Well, I think people have seen me in that speaker slide so many times by now. But yeah, feel free to read that slide if you downloaded it later or take a quick glance at it. It hasn't changed since we started this morning uh, with the MVA. So maybe your slide will be a little bit more interesting. I like the fact that you're putting your breakfast of the day on the slide. I think that's yeah, super well, interesting. Well, you know, um, actually, uh, this it turned out to be a lie. Uh, I made the pancakes this morning. It I started was aspirational making, when we it wrote was the slide. Okay. I actually did start making pancakes uh, this morning, and I ran out of eggs, so it didn't happen. But oh, bummer! I tried. Yeah. I had a I had a protein veggie smoothie for breakfast. Nice. Yeah, no, that was my breakfast. Nice. I don't know. That's, that's you, great news. You wanted to know that. Okay. Uh, into the uh, into the content here. So um, we've got this Connect platform, and I'm sure a lot of you have, have have seen some of the features that we provide as part of this platform. Uh, and there's a number of different sort of tracking technologies that, that are all built into here. And they essentially track different aspects of the scene. Things like, you know, full body skeleton tracking, hand state, um, expressions for facial tracking, et cetera, et cetera. And your fun job as developers is to kind of take all these inputs and, and try to wrangle them in to a gesture recognizer that tries to make some sense out of it all and then does some action as a result of the user doing some action. Hopefully you do the right thing. Uh, and then you'll end up with a happy user. Um, but as we know with Connect, it can be all too easy to um, not do the right thing or not do anything at all in response to the user. Uh, and then you often end up with a, with a less happy user as a result. Um, typically, the goal is the happy user. Uh, you could probably write an app that tries to make users less happy, um, but it might affect your sales. 
so the focus of this talk is going to be on uh, the gesture recognition layer. What can you do inside of your apps on top of the platform to make the best use of the inputs that we're providing? Uh, and as I said, we provide a lot of interesting features that you can use to get off to a pretty good start building your interactions. Um, you're going to be able to get up and running pretty quickly in your applications. Uh, but keep in mind that the different features we provide are not always a complete 100% solution. Uh, you're not going to be able to always just drop these in and away you go, ship your app. Um, a lot of times for the best possible experience, what you're going to want to do is a little bit of custom filtering on top of the platform. The idea is you can take your knowledge of what your scenario is to really custom tune your interaction uh, to get the most value where you need it. And you're going to have to make some trade-offs. You're going to have to deprioritize things that are, that are less important to your experience in order to get an even better result for the things that are important in your experience. So, so I think what that, you're saying is, you know, one size does not fit all here. We, we do our best right. to create a platform that makes it really easy for people to do as many things as possible, but take what we're giving you and customize, tweak it, and get it right and dialed in for your specific environment, your specific application, your specific gesture, whatever it may be. That's exactly right, Ben. So we provide this baseline, uh, and then the, the goal is that you build on top of that and make it great for your experience. Cool. Uh, so we're going to look at two case studies in that vein. Uh, the first is the system cursor, and the second is a depth-based motion detector. And I'm going to jump right into the system cursor here. Uh, so what is the system cursor? It's basically the idea that you know, you're going to be able to raise your hand, get a cursor on screen, and then move that cursor around to navigate um, a user interface. It was one of the first things we started on um, when working on Xbox One. Uh, for two reasons. Number one, we knew we, that we were going to need one for the UI. But two, uh, the system cursor is actually really good at pushing some of the more uh, precision and stability-oriented aspects of skeleton tracking. So we knew that if we got the system cursor working pretty well, um, a lot would fall, follow as a result. I want to stress that uh, system cursor is not just about UI navigation. Um, system cursor is really part of a class of interactions that are all about having this high precision hand point out in front of your body. Another aspect of the system cursor is that it's body relative. Um, the idea is I want to be able to hold my hand out right here, you know, relative to my body, and that maps to the same location on the screen as if I were over here a little bit and raise my hand in the same location. Body relative positioning. Uh, and then the other, the other aspect of the system cursor is that the movement is going to be primarily in front of your body. Uh, and we call that area in front of your body uh, the FIZ, which stands for Physical Human Interaction Zone. So as I said, there's, there's a lot of different use cases for this kind of interaction. Uh, one might be any kind of steering that you're going to do uh, in your experience, maybe a simulation. Uh, any kind of aiming where you're going to point at some target on the screen and you need to know exactly where they're pointing to. Anything uh, that involves like pushing something or swiping or gripping and moving something where you need to know sort of that nice clean uh, analog signal of where do the user start and end. These are all great cases where you'd want to use something that provides that sort of high precision point in front of the body. Uh, and also, you know, I'm going to talk a lot in terms of the system cursor, but keep in mind that a lot of these filtering techniques apply to lots of different aspects of skeleton tracking filtering. So as you're, as you're watching this, you know, think about different ways you could apply it to your own interaction. So what's a basic uh, cursor algorithm look like? Well, the first thing you got to do is figure out where you're going to put the fizz. Uh, in our case, we chose the shoulder as sort of the anchor point. The fizz is going to move with the user's shoulder. Then you're going to offset that point to sort of the desired center location of the fizz. Once you've got that, you're going to determine the boundaries of the fizz, both uh, the orientation relative to the body, so what direction uh, constitutes left and right movement across the screen and up and down movement across the screen, and then scale it based on both the size of the player and also the interaction that you're looking for in your app. Uh, and then lastly, uh, once you figure out where the fizz is for this frame, you're going to want to take that, that position on the person's hand and map that into the fizz and into uh, screen space coordinates. So that's all fine and dandy. Uh, the first challenge that you're going to get into uh, when you start using an anchor point on the body is what I call the anchor movement problem. You know, it's great that when the anchor point moves, uh, the fizz moves, right? That's how we get the body relative 
coordinate system. We want, as you slide over, for the point to slide over with you so that you get the same location on the screen. However, some of these core joints that you might use for an anchor point, well, when you cover them with your hand, you're going to find that they move around a little bit. And the problem is, when they start moving around, you're going to get some cursor movement on the screen, and that's, that's never very good. Um, so how do we filter that? And there's going to be a trade-off here. We want to try and make that anchor point as stable as possible, but we're going to find that the more we filter it, um, you know, the less accurate we are in terms of staying body relative with our fizz. So we thought through a lot of different ways to filter that anchor point. Uh, we first tried a rolling average, but that still let a lot of wandering through. We tried using like the opposite shoulder, but that would still kind of move around a lot as the user was moving their, their hand. We also tried this fancy uh, latch-based technique where we would try to um, detect if only the shoulder was moving or if all the different joints on the user's body were moving in the same direction and try and lock the joint if it, if it was just the shoulder moving and unlock it if the whole body was moving. And that was so complicated that we had a lot of false positives and he just kind of backed out of that. What we ended up with that worked pretty well is what we call um, the accumulated average filter. It's actually very straightforward. Uh, instead of, it's very similar to a rolling average, except instead of having like a time window where you're going to average all your joint positions together for the shoulder, take that shoulder position for every frame and average it together forever and always. Every single frame that you get, you're going to throw into that, into that average, and that's going to really lock that joint into a position near the shoulder. So there's some code for doing it. Basically, every time you get a new shoulder position for a new frame, you're going to take a very small fraction of that new, precision, that new position and add it to a very large fraction of your current anchor point position. Um, and that's, that's, that works really well for, for making the joint hold really still. But the challenge you're going to run into is, you know, of course, if I slide over here, um, well, I just left my anchor back over there. And now I'm not going to have a very nice time using my cursor. I'll have to hold my hand way over here to actually use the cursor. So what we do in that case is we watch every new joint that we receive. We watch and see how far is this new joint from the current anchor position. And if it goes beyond some threshold, we're going to go ahead and just reset that anchor point joint. Uh, and there's some code for doing it. We chose a threshold of about 15 centimeters, uh, which is, it seemed to catch all the different cases where the shoulder would, would pop. The idea here is you want to pick a threshold where shoulder movement, when the body's not moving, is not going to be far enough to reset the filter. Um, you may want to try scaling that based on player size, too. Uh, and of course, this does trade a little bit of um, body relative accuracy for cursor stability, right? If I lean a little bit left or right, the fizz is not going to move very much. But for this type of application, we actually felt it was better to have that, that super precise cursor. OK, so we've got the anchor point filtered. Next thing we're going to do is uh, calculate the orientation of the fizz. So this is basically, where is the fizz facing in world space? Uh, you might be tempted to want to rotate the fizz along with the user. So if I'm pointing over here, you know, I'm going to be able to navigate uh, the screen this way. And that would be nice, except the, the challenge is, uh, as soon as you start using all these extra joints to calculate the orientation of the user, you know, often you'd use the shoulders to do this. Once you start doing that, you're kind of introducing some noise into the system. Uh, and we find that actually, uh, if you just orient the fizz so that it's always facing the sensor, you can get away with having less inputs to your cursor system and less opportunity for noise. Um, you know, they say in, in graphics development, the fastest triangle is the one that you don't render. Um, and there's a corollary, at least in, in Connect, which is the, the smoothest joint is the one, um, is the one you don't use. So um, how do you do that? Well, first you're going to want to align the y-axis, which is basically the direction of up and down on the screen. You're going to want to align that to, to gravity. Um, there's a value in the API on the body frame called floor clip plane. And the x, y, z components of that are going to be an up vector pointing in the direction of, well, basically of the sky. Uh, this value is primarily derived from the detection of the floor plane. Uh, but if the floor plane is not available, it'll use the accelerometer that's built into the sensor. So you can always rely on this for a reliable up vector. So what you're going to want to do is basically rotate the scene such that um, the up vector is facing up. Rotate all your input joints so that all of them are aligned and the up direction 
is 0, 1, 0. Then once you've rotated in Y space, you're going to want to rotate the X space. X is basically you know, the direction I have to move my hand to move left and right on the screen. Um, there, you're going to want to create a uh, sensor direction vector. This is similar to setting up a, a, a view camera in graphics. Uh, create a sensor direction that goes from the center of the fizz to the sensor, and that's going to be your Z. And then take the cross product of that with you know, 0, 1, 0, the up vector, to get a vector pointing in the X direction. And then you're going to want to rotate your scene um, such that the fizz is now facing the sensor with that information. So once you've got your fizz rotated, uh, you're going to need, need to think about the size of the fizz. A couple of different things to keep in mind uh, when you consider the fizz size. Um, number one, uh, the size of the fizz has a big impact on both the sensitivity of the interaction. The smaller the fizz, the, the less I have to move to move the cursor across the screen. Uh, but the smaller fizz also has the impact of kind of magnifying any noise that might be inherent in the joint positions. Any jitter that you've got is going to be a little bit more magnified. Um, so try to play with the size and try to get the right baseline fizz size for your own experience. And it, it's going to vary a little bit depending on the interaction that you're going for. Uh, also keep in mind that uh, people tend to like to keep their elbows still when they're interacting out in front. That's going to help minimize uh, fatigue if they have to use the system for a longer period of time. Once you've got that baseline size, you're going to want to scale up and down based on the size of the user. It's very important that for any given user, I'm able to actually comfortably reach the left and right sides of the screen. Um, for that, you're going to want to take a measurement. Uh, generally, the forearm length is a really good measure to get if you can. Um, of, but there's some challenges there because it's not always visible. Um, the, the elbow joint might be occluded or the wrist joint might be occluded. It can be a little bit harder to get that measurement. You might find that it's easier to get a shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder measurement because they're visible more of the time. Um, but those might not correlate as well with arm length. So experiment with both uh, and see what trade-offs work best for your own application. Uh, whatever you do, though, make sure you lock the size as early as possible. This is another case where any, any bouncing in the, in the size uh, measurement that you're taking is going to also cause fizz um, wandering, cursor wandering on the screen. So whatever you do, try to lock it down as early as possible and just stop updating it so that you're not impacting cursor stability as a result. So, Casey, have you ever seen examples where somebody's trying to say, um, you know, lock on to maybe the forearm or the shoulders as the fallback as you're recommending, but then in the particular situation, the, the measurement was just wrong. There were, the user was in a weird position. Do you recommend that people just stick with the first measurement and ride it out because of, like you said, that delta frame over frame can kind of cause yeah. jitter? Or is there a way to adjust or do you even recommend adjusting? Yeah, well, you know, one thing, one thing that you might try is actually taking that same accumulation filter that we used for the anchor joint and apply that to the distance measurement that you've got. And then watch for new measurements coming in. And if you see a new measurement that's greater than some delta from the measurement you have, go ahead and re-snap to that. Otherwise, just let it ride. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so you've got your fizz positioned and scaled and rotated. The next thing you get to do is figure out what, um, what joint you actually want to track as the active movement joint inside of uh, your fizz. So, uh, you know, we find that the hand joint is a pretty darn good joint for this kind of, kind of behavior. The hand joint, the hand center, is easily the most, or one of the most precise joints in the skeleton. Uh, as a side note, the head is also quite precise, but you know, for cursor interaction, you probably not want to use the head. Uh, you might also consider the hand tip. It's a very close second in terms of precision to the, um, to the hand center joint. Um, it's also more sensitive to slight movements of the hand. Like if I do rotations of my hand, I'll get a little bit more motion on the screen as a result, and some users kind of like that. Uh, keep in mind if you do that though, that the tip is going to generate more motion of the cursor if you're opening and closing your hand. So if you've got open and close type uh, gestures in your application, uh, you keep that in mind because you might have to compensate for that movement on open and close. Whatever you do, um, don't use the wrist uh, for any kind of precision tracking um, interaction. We actually used to recommend on Connect V1 that you use the wrist. We actually recommended that you average the wrist and the hand joint together, 
And that used to work good, but the skeleton has been improved dramatically, the hand joint has been improved dramatically, and we highly recommend if you're still using the wrist um, to upgrade to the hand center. So uh, once you've got that uh, hand joint that you're going to use, um, the skeleton has improved quite a bit on this new sensor, but you're still going to want to do a little bit of filtering to get it just right. Um, and the goal is, of course, for a cursor to have motion as one-to-one -one with the user's motion as possible. Um, there's still going to be a little bit of tiny jitter in there, uh, just inherent in the depth image. You're going to see a little bit of movement of that hand joint. And, of course, when the user's holding their hand still, even though the joint's moving a little bit, you want to make sure that, that, we're, that we're holding the cursor still in that case. And, of course, we're, we're looking for a quick response when the user's hand does move. Um, and we also want to make sure the, the cursor stops nice and quick when the user's hand stops. These are all things that we felt were important for our cursor system. So we looked around at a bunch of filters that we, um, that we had laying around. Uh, and we had one from 360 days uh, and Connect V1 days called the uh, double exponential filter. Uh, pretty straightforward implementation of a pretty straightforward, well-known algorithm. And it continues to work pretty well um, for filtering skeleton joints. Um, so things that we like about it, uh, one thing is it suppresses motion within a radius. If you're holding your hand still and you're getting a little bit of jitter there, uh, the double exponential filter is going to hold that nice and still on the screen. Uh, we used a value of about five centimeters for the jitter radius because this value is con configurable in the filter that we used. Uh, it also dampens movement outside of the, uh, the primary motion direction. So if I start here and slide over this way on the screen, if there was a little bit of jitter up and down along that path of motion, it's going to compress that into a nice straight line. We like that. Um, it also has tunable latency. You know, one of the great things about the skeleton on this new sensor, uh, we've reduced latency on frame delivery. Also, the skeleton is more stable to begin with. So the idea is you can apply um, filtering that uses fewer frames and get even better latency as a result. So you can tune that latency, tune it down as low as you can, uh, while still keeping the cursor as smooth as possible. And you should see that compared to Connect V1, you're going to get um, a lot of extra mileage out of that. Um, so we're working on getting this source code posted to the forums. Yeah, could we, could we actually just make a real-time change to this slide? Could you just escape out for a second? Sure, Ben. What I'd like to do is instead of putting our email address there, uh, I'd like to just put the URL for people to use to go to the forum. So it's, okay. a, it's an aka.ms link. So it's aka.ms slash k, the number 4, w, v2 forum. And that'll forward people right to the v2 forum. Okay. Does that look like I got it right? We can go ahead and put it back on screen. I'm, we've already given the email address out for other things, but I just want to make sure people... Uh, yeah, that's perfect. All right. Thank you. There it is. Um, so one thing to consider about the double exponential is it has a uh, prediction component. Uh, the prediction component can be pretty useful uh, because essentially uh, it helps the, the position in your, in your experience sort of catch up to real time with the user's hand. Uh, the challenge though when you're using prediction is that um, it has a tendency to overshoot sometimes if the user stops really fast. So definitely play with that. Uh, we ended up turning it down pretty low for our experience, but based on your interaction, you may want to uh, to have a little bit of prediction built in. So, Casey, as you've been going through this, I mean, we've talked about the fizz quite a bit. Um, you weren't here earlier this morning when uh, when Rob and and Mark were talking a lot about the fizz and uh, hand cursor, a lot of things that you're talking about. Yeah. So I think kind of, you know, for for people who are watching who who've watched Module Three, this is kind of a different approach to the fizz. It's almost like a custom fizz, if you will. Yeah. And I would say to people out there, and I want to hear your thoughts on this, but I would say to them, the fizz that we've invested in, the thing that you know Mark and, and Rob talked about earlier, it's been tested, it's been refined, it's been tuned. It works in a lot of cases for a, a lot of different people. We're going to continue investing there and improving that. So I wanted to know, like, how do you think about that and what you're talking about? And then where would I think about deviating from that sort of custom, yeah. out-of-the-box fizz, if you will, that we yeah, talked about sure. earlier? Yeah, for sure. So a couple of good points there. Uh, so we've got this system cursor that's already built in uh, to, to connect for Windows and to Xbox One that you can just use. Um, and this is actually mostly how we built it. It's using this, these concepts are the same kind of filtering concepts that we use uh, 
inside of that system cursor already. The main deltas are around sort of the fizz shape and, and size. And so what I would say is go ahead and try to use, if you're doing a, a two-dimensional kind of interaction, go ahead and try to use the system cursor that we provide because a lot of this stuff is already baked in. We're giving you kind of like an under-the-covers look at how we built it right now. Um, However, if you do need to do some custom work, like if you want the fizz to be a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller or a slightly different shape, that's when you would have to dive in and kind of rebuild your own fizz uh, using these concepts okay. yourself. Does that make sense? Yeah, cool. Thank yeah. you. And with that, I've got my first demo for you guys. So I'm going to launch this app that I call House of Cursors. And this is basically our um, our cursor demo playground app where we try lots of different things and I can essentially navigate around. I'm hoping that right off the bat you're seeing the cursor is pretty darn smooth and I can press buttons in this app and all that good stuff. Uh, the first thing I want to show you guys though, I'm going to turn off the push. The first thing I want to show you guys, if you see that red joint that's kind of following me around on my shoulder, that's the accumulated average joint. That's the, that's the center of the fizz that has been accumulated and really kind of locked into position. You can see how as I move my hand over top of my shoulder, you see the real shoulder back there kind of jumping around, but you don't see that red point jumping around at all. Um, and that's the idea. And as I walk over here a little bit, you're gonna, you guys see it reset there? So I walk over here, it kind of resets and, and it slides in, locks into position. Reset, slides in, reset slides in. So it does update pretty quickly if you move a lot from, from where you were, but if you move just a little bit, it's going to hold real still and give you a nice stable cursor position. Now the next thing I want to show is I can actually turn this off and just use the raw shoulder as the anchor point for my fizz. And what you're going to see is as soon as I go over my shoulder, the cursor starts behaving kind of badly, right? Like that's exactly what we don't want. So you're seeing that's, that's how much filtering that accumulation filter is actually providing right now. Um, I think it's pretty good. That's great. It's a, that's a really on. helpful visualization just to see the different, I mean, when you turn that on and off, it's very noticeable. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> All right, the next thing I want to show you guys is, um, is using the hand tip. So that green point there that's following my, my right hand tip, um, I basically turned that on as the cursor location. And you can see I'm getting a lot of sensitivity as I rotate my hand back and forth. It's real nice. I can kind of draw circles with, my, with the tip of my finger and get that movement there in the cursor. And as I said earlier, the drawback, though, is that as I open and close, I almost move a whole box, a whole button um, in screen space. And so if that's not something that you like, we can go back to the hand center joint, and you can see as I open and close, you know, I get a lot less movement on that cursor. But both are pretty stable. Both are fairly useful for, um, for cursoring type activities. So play around with both and just see what works best for your own experience. The last thing I want to show you guys is um, the prediction. So this app has prediction turned down pretty low. I've just turned it back up to, uh, to normal values. And what you're going to see is, is I, if I move really fast, do you guys see that recoil? that kind of happens. Right after I stop, it kind of overshoots and then corrects. That's the effect of prediction. However, as I move around, it feels pretty snappy. It feels like it's keeping up with me a little bit faster, maybe, than with prediction turned off. So there's going to be a trade-off there. Uh, if you like that snappiness, if you're okay with that or not, uh, it's all going to be based on your own experience. Let me turn that back off and show you the fast stop. You can see how much faster it stops when I turn it off. Um, so those are just some different aspects um, of the cursor algorithm that I wanted to show all you guys sort of in real time in a live view there. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk about um, related to the system cursor is, you know, I said earlier these concepts apply to lots of different things, not just high precision points in front of your body. In fact, after we built the system cursor, we went through and we decided we wanted to work on a lean tracker. The lean tracker is actually available already as part of the body frame and it tracks left and right motion and forward and back motion. We built the lean tracker using a lot of these same concepts. You know, the idea with lean tracking is you need, a, you need an anchor point and we used the hip joints as the anchor point. We went ahead and applied the accumulation filter to them just like we did on the shoulder. We assume the player is facing the sensor, 
uh, which allows us to get rid of extra noise that we incur from using shoulder joints to get the player's orientation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and we use the head, the double exponential on the, the head and the neck position, which is sort of the active, lo active location, active movement position of the player. Um, and there's some other techniques that we layered on top of this. We did a little bit of quantization to make sure that when the player is leaning, we hold, we hold their angle really still. Uh, but largely, it's the same concepts that we took from System Cursor and applied them to, to others. And I'm sure there's plenty more out there. Okay. So now we're on to case study number two, which is the motion detector. This is a depth-based motion detector. You might be asking yourselves, you know, we're providing this fancy skeleton tracking system. Why might you want to use uh, the depth directly for, um, for gesture recognition? And the answer is, well, you know, the skeleton, we think it's pretty great, but we know that it's not perfect. Uh, and there's some poses that it just doesn't do as well in, right? You guys have probably seen these too. Uh, cases where the user's lying down, if they're sitting down and leaning really back, like into a couch, um, if they've got their legs up, including large sections of their body. You know, we don't do too great if you're sitting like this in your chair and kind of hiding under your legs. Uh, you can see in this example here, um, I've overlaid skeleton tracking on top of the depth, and the hand joint is, you know, definitely not being tracked by the skeleton, right? So if you expect your users to be in a pose like this, where skeleton tracking is not working as well, you might want to augment with depth processing. Uh, and then there's other cool things you can do with depth. You know, you can add functionality to the platform that's not, you know, built in already. Uh, if you want to tra track things that are not people, uh, if you want to track, you know, new and different things on people, like maybe you want to track their fingers, that would be a good example where um, depth processing would be for you. It's also great for working around any gesture detection issues that you're getting. Uh, you can basically go to depth to get a second opinion. If you see some movement in the skeleton, um, you can use the depth to help filter that. Um, also, it's great as a second opinion to suppress any false motion. You know, in some poses, you might get a little bit of movement in the skeleton, even though the player is not moving. Well, if you go into depth and check depth and kind of get that second opinion of, hey, did they really move here? Um, that can go a long ways towards suppressing false positive gestures in your experience. So, motion detection. Um, we actually built this for a launch title for Xbox One last year. A uh, controller-based game where bad guys grab you and they wanted you to be able to basically make a movement to escape from that, that grapple gesture. Uh, and they were using ST, but they, they were finding what's that... A, what, can you, ST, what's that? Oh, good question, Ben. So ST stands for skeleton tracking. Uh, they were using skeleton tracking, uh, and they were finding that it wasn't working for some of the cases where their players were, were sitting in. Um, their goal was to support you know, super laid-back uh, poses. You know, these, are, these are gamers that want to lean back and enjoy their game. They don't want to have to sit up and make sure skeleton tracking works. Um, but they were finding that they were, they were getting, using skeleton tracking, too many false positives and they, or, or cases where they're getting false negatives. You know, the user would flail and they wouldn't actually escape the grapple and they would end up dead. And that's not fun. Um, so we talked with these guys and what we discovered was, hey, they, they, they weren't doing anything super sophisticated in terms of their process and they just wanted any gesture to work. Um, it didn't matter what part of the body moved. You could do a headbutt or, or flail your arms or kick your legs. Any of that would be acceptable. And so it dawned on us that, hey, um, maybe skeleton tracking isn't the right fit for this experience. Um, we could use the depth directly and build a motion detector that would be a lot more reliable uh, in these poses. And it turned out that was true. Uh, we've got a much more reliable result. And we ended up shipping this uh, as part of the game. So what do you need to do motion detection? Well, the first thing you need um, is a depth image. Of course, that's one of the core um, feeds that comes off of our sensor. Um, and I'm sure you guys have already heard this, but the, the idea of a depth sensor is, is you've got um, an image, and for each pixel in the image, it's giving you the distance in millimeters that that pixel saw uh, in the scene. Uh, also very helpful for a motion detector is uh, what we call the segmentation mask. It's known in the API as the body index frame. The idea here is, um, the segmentation mask is going to save you a lot of time. It's going to highlight um, exactly which pixels belong to players and which pixels belong to 
uh, the background. And there can be up to uh, six different people in the scene. The segmentation mask will actually distinguish different people from each other. Um, so it's, great, it's a great way to focus your attention on just a small area of the depth image. Uh, and then lastly, you know, there's, there's six different people that can be tracked uh, in the segmentation mask. Um, you'll have to choose which one to track. Uh, maybe you want to choose based on the closest person to the sensor or the person that's moving the most. Uh, it's up to you to decide based on your experience which, which user you want to track or all of them. We, we say player a lot. We actually, that's interchangeable with user or body. Kind of our Xbox that's, heritage with Connect coming through a lot. That, we, we say player and user and body interchangeably usually. That's right? correct, Ben. Yeah. Yep. All right, so once you've got all these inputs, um, the motion detector algorithm is actually pretty straightforward. What you're going to do is for every pixel in the depth image that's also part of the segmentation mask, you're going to compare the value at that pixel to the value of that pixel on the last frame. Get the delta in millimeters. What was the delta there? If that delta is greater than some threshold that you get to choose, then you can go ahead and mark that pixel as having moved. Then once you've gone through all the pixels in the segmentation image, um, you can count up how many pixels you marked as moved. And if that's greater than some threshold, then you can go ahead and say, yes, the player has moved, and go ahead and execute your gesture. Um, and this is about what it looks like. The interesting thing when you're doing depth delta-based motion detection is um, it actually catches both where the player, where the user's arms are and where they used to be, because it sees the movement in both, in both locations. You can see that highlighted in green here. Uh, the algorithm is pretty straightforward, but there are, um, you're going to run into some challenges that are sort of inherent in depth processing in general, and I'm going to go through those next. The first challenge you're going to run into is in counting the number of moved pixels. Um, the challenge here is when you start counting pixels, you're going to risk becoming resolution dependent, right? When the user is closer to the sensor, there's going to be more pixels moving on the screen, and that's going to cause your detector to go off more easily. And if the player is farther away from the sensor, you're going to have fewer pixels moving, and at that point, you might risk not firing at all. So what we recommend here is to uh, not count pixels, but instead calculate the area of movement in the image. Here's a um, formula for doing that. You basically take the average depth in the location that you're interested in, the average depth distance in millimeters, and multiply that by the inverse focal length of the camera. And that's a value that I've got coming up next in the slide here. You square that and then multiply it by the number of pixels, and you're going to get basically a measurement of the amount of area that moved. And that, that measurement is going to be the same whether you're a meter from the sensor or four meters from the sensor. It's all going to be the same value. So you can use the, th the same threshold for that and not have to worry about um, people far away not working. Um, there's the, uh, the approximate inverse focal length. We went ahead and um, calculated that just based on the specifications of the camera. Uh, note you can sometimes get away with percentage as a way of being resolution independent. Basically count the number of pixels that moved and divide that by the total number of pixels in the segmentation mask. Uh, the challenge there is the segmentation mask might not always have all the user's value pixels in it, right? Like it might be cut off at the hips and you're going to get wildly different percentages. So just be careful about that if you want to go that route. And it's cut off because of occlusions? Or Often because of occlusion, yeah. Yeah, we see a lot of cases where you know, the, user's, the user's leaning back, uh, especially on, on Xbox. They've got a coffee table in front of them. And we just don't see the legs. And so the segmentation mask, I'll back up so you can see, basically starts here and goes up to the top of their head. And you've got half a body, half the area to work with. So just keep that in mind. So the next challenge is what I call the, the zero pixel challenge. Um, you will see zero pixels in the depth image. Uh, it basically means no data. Um, but no data can come from two different sources. Um, it can either mean that it was a low confidence pixel. Um, we have pixels um, where maybe the light return was kind of low from the projector. Um, this could happen in cases where you've got like a window or you're wearing leather pants or you've got a leather couch, low reflective materials effectively. Or it could be cases where 
the, um, the light return didn't make any sense. Sometimes the sensor might not get a very good read on things that are on edges of your body or if you've got like a highly reflective t-shirt or things like that. So this is essentially noise when you get a bad pixel uh, in these cases. The challenge is it can also mean that, um, that the sensor saw depth beyond its maximum range. Um, I wrote four and a half meters in these slides. Uh, the good news is that's not true anymore. We actually raised recently the uh, maximum depth range to eight meters. Um, so you're going to see zero pixels for anything that was past uh, eight meters um, with the, uh, the final SDK. Now the challenge is that you want to you want to handle things differently based on what type of pixel it is. Is it a flickery noise pixel or is it really background? But the depth image doesn't really say which is which. Um, if you don't filter these at all, all those noisy pixels that are on the person's body are going to create some false motion. So what are some options for doing it? The first one is, and we used this in the motion detector, you can just skip them. Um, if you come across a frame where either the current frame or the last frame was um, a zero pixel, go ahead and just ignore that, uh, that value, ignore that pixel for the frame, don't count it. Um, and this works great for filtering them out because you're effectively ignoring them. Um, however, um, it could mute uh, any kind of motions that happen in front of things that are really far away. So what you'll find is this approach works really well if I'm moving my hands sort of in front of my body and I've got real depth on top of real depth. But if I'm making motions out to the side here and my background is beyond uh, the eight meter mark, you're going to have a lot of zeros back there that are causing less sensitivity in this range. So the option uh, two, if you want to go ahead and handle that, and if your experience calls for motion sort of at the silhouette edge, um, you can try to figure out which is which. The good news is um, zero pixels that are things far away, um, well, they tend to be zero for many consecutive frames in a row, as opposed to pixels that are on edges, which will kind of flicker in and out. So what you can do is basically for each pixel in the depth image, keep track of how many times you've seen zero pixels in a row. If you get to more than 10 or 15, go ahead and assume that that is maximum depth for the purposes of motion detection. Go ahead and use that value and do the delta versus maximum depth. Um, otherwise, go ahead and ignore just like before. And this, of course, brings back the silhouette edges, but uh, it's going to cost you a little more CPU and a little more memory um, to sort of store that history. I said earlier we used option one. Um, for our motion detector for, uh, for this Xbox One title just because uh, it was a little bit cheaper on CPU and most of the motions when you're holding a controller are going to start from in front of your body and so we, we were catching all the motions we needed to catch in this experience. So you've gone ahead and you've, you've filtered for all those zero pixels. Um, what you're going to find next is even after all that filtering there's still some pixels um, uh, a lot fewer, but there are still some pixels that are going to bounce forward and backwards and be real depth values forward and backwards uh, frame over frame. And sometimes these pixels can go beyond your threshold and in that case they'll cause some false motion. So what can you do about them? Well, what we are, did... Those are what? Those are just like artifacts from the, the analog technology yeah, that we're using? Yeah, it could be a result of, of ambient, you know, some ambient light in the scene, different reflectivities. You'll just, you'll just find that, you know, a lot of the pixels, the pixels on average are pretty well behaved, but every now and again you'll get a pixel just based on the angle uh, that might jitter a little more than the others. Yeah, and that's what these are. Um, so what we did to, to reduce these is um, well, what I'm calling depth delta cancellation. The idea that is instead of just doing one frame's worth of of deltas, go ahead and do two frames worth and then add them together. So if a pixel starts here and then bounces forward on a different frame and then goes right back to really close to where it was on the very next frame, well the total distance the pixel moved was probably less than your movement threshold. You can cancel a lot of those out and that works really well. It adds a little bit of latency uh, but it does cancel out a lot of these jittery pixels. Okay, so that was filtering on the depth delta threshold, sort of the frame over frame per pixel uh, threshold. Once you've done all that, you're still going to find that there are some cases where you've just got an area that's kind of noisy. Uh, in this image that I've got here on the slide, you can see all those green pixels. This is a case where the segmentation mask actually picked up a little bit more than just the player. 
And all those pixels that are marked green are pixels that are kind of bouncing around in the scene uh, and causing some false motion. If you don't filter these, it's of course going to be triggering the motion detector all the time. You don't really want that. Um, so what we ended up doing for this one <clears throat> is uh, an adaptive threshold. Essentially, we're going to establish a, um, a, a, a noise baseline, a noise floor for the room. And that's going to adapt based on the average uh, movement area that we see frame over frame and the standard deviation. And then the idea is once you've established this, this baseline noise floor, you're going to look for spikes in the area that go far enough above this noise floor. And when you see those spikes, that's when you're going to trigger your detection. I've got a, just some code there for doing it. We ended up using uh, the average plus two times the standard deviation plus a fixed threshold to get this just right. And so you've got this basically this bar that's sliding up and down as the room changes. And then when you see spikes, that's going to trigger your motion detector. <clears throat> and that's all fine and dandy, except um, whenever you've got a noise floor like this, well, it captures both noise and real movement. So the challenge is uh, when the player starts moving around, if they're moving around a lot, that noise floor is going to get higher and higher and higher and higher to the point where, um, well, you're not triggering the motion detector anymore because your movement is now just part of the noise floor, right? So the recommendation here is to employ a uh, rise slow and fall fast policy. Um, when the user is moving, you want to make sure that noise floor takes a long time to actually catch up with them. And that's usually okay because the noise floor in the real room is going to be real consistent over time. So you're going to be able, you're going to adapt to that early on. And then as soon as you detect the user's not moving, as soon as there's been a real fast drop in the area of motion, go ahead and drop that noise floor right back down. Uh, and so the algorithm, for each new uh, frame area that you get, um, if it's above the current noise floor, uh, only increase the noise floor by one one hundredth of the delta. Uh, and you can change that value based on, on, on your own taste, but that's a, a value that we chose that worked pretty good. So if the noise floor is here and your next input area is here, uh, only increase the floor by about one one hundredth of that distance for that frame. It really suppressing that growth. Uh, but then, uh, if the noise floor gets kind of high, and then you notice that for about 10 frames in a row, you've had a, a, a current motion area of something that's really far below that noise floor, and you can define what that threshold is, go ahead and drop that noise floor right back down. We used a value of 10 frames in a row. Um, really, that's going to correlate to, once the user's moving, how long do they need to stop before the, the noise floor is going to reset back down. So you can tune that value based on your experience, too. Uh, you know, and if you don't, if you don't hit either, either of those cases, go ahead and just update the running average and standard deviation uh, as usual. Um, so I just dropped a lot of concepts on you guys. I've got a demo that tries to, uh, to cover a lot of these live. It's called Motion Man. I'll bring the keyboard back here with me. Um, so what I'm displaying right now is essentially um, a live 3D depth feed. I can actually zoom in and look around at this depth feed. It's a live 3D depth feed, um, but it's bounded on the segmentation mask. You can see, uh, you know, as I move, you guys see that green area. Those are, the, those are the depth delta pixels that are firing. You can see it's kind of happening both where, I've, where I'm going and where I've been. You can see there's a lot of good movement uh, in front of my body, but because we're ignoring zero pixels, if I go out here, you're going to see less movement. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is I can turn the flash, oops, turn the flash back on. There we go. And I, I'm just basically flashing the whole thing red whenever the motion area has exceeded a threshold that says, hey, the player moved. So the idea is, you know, I can be sitting back here playing some game, and then, you know, I've been grabbed by somebody, ah, and then it turned red, so great, I escaped, right? And this is um, very sensitive. I can make little tiny movements of my hand, and it's picking these up, right? And I can be in poses that ST might not support very well. This isn't very comfortable. Uh, but, you know, I can kind of hide behind my legs and go, ah, right? And I can trigger this motion detector. So you get fairly sensitive results. Um, 
in, in a lot of different poses that, that skeleton tracking might not support as well. So the next thing I want to do in here is I'm going to actually, um, I'm going to turn off the uh, zero pixel handling. You can see right away that my guy turns a little bit red there. Let me uh, disable that. There we go. You can see right away my guy turns red, and you can see um, if you look at the motion pixel count value there, do you see that's right around like, I don't know, 89, 100, 90? It's kind of high, right? That's because of all the edge pixels that are, actually, that are triggering my motion detector. If I actually go ahead and filter those edge pixels by not allowing zero pixels, you can see that uh, that drops back down to like 5 or 10. So filtering zero pixels is really important. Now the next thing I want to show you guys is I'm going to turn on a visualization of the noise floor. Now the blue line right here is the current noise floor. I've actually um, I've turned off the updating of it. So this is just using a fixed threshold. The green line is the current motion area. And you can see when I make movement that causes the green line to spike above the blue, it's also firing my motion detector. So these are aligned. That's good. Um, what I want to show you, though, is with this fixed threshold, I'm going to turn the zero pixel handling back off. And that's going to simulate a noisy environment, right? Basically, my noise, this is a fixed threshold. I'm not using the noise floor. And I'm getting, as a result, uh, in a noisier room, you know, constant firing of the motion detector. And that's not what we want. But right now, I'm going to go ahead and turn the noise floor back on. And what you're going to see is that the blue line rises and takes care of that baseline noise that I've created in the scene. Right? And now we're back to normal. So we've simulated a noisier room, and the noise floor is adjusted, and great. I can still, I can still go ahead and move, uh, and I can still generate um, motion, generate the motion uh, detector. The next thing I want to do, and the very last thing here, is I'm going to turn off um, the noise floor management aspect. I'm going to turn off the rise, slow, and fall fast policy. What you're going to see now is as I move, you see how fast the noise floor went up? It's totally maxed out right now. I can't trigger the gesture detection at all. I have to wait and wait for that thing to come back down. And now I can move again, but oh, you know, now it, it's not going anymore, right? So this is, a, this is a problem because I'm becoming part of the noise floor when I move. Um, I'm going to do that again, but I'm going to turn the noise floor management back on. And you're going to see that, hey, it takes a much longer time for that blue to catch me. And if I pause, you see how, far, how fast that falls back down? Um, so that's that policy in effect. And you can tune that delay between the time that you stop moving and the time that it falls, you know, basically to your own taste. So that's the Motion Man uh, demo. OK, I've got one last slide here. Uh, just to wrap up on the motion detector, a uh, lot of interesting use cases. Of course, it's basically like an extra button for games, and I talked about that a lot. Uh, it's also great, and I talked about a little bit earlier with regard to uh, depth processing, that you can use uh, this check to basically see, hey, is the skeleton really moving? I see false mo motion in the skeleton. I see some motion in the skeleton. I want to check the depth to see, hey, did they really move? Uh, and you can extend this to do more. There's lots of different things you could do uh, using purely motion if you're interested. You could detect what side the motion was on and turn that one button press into three. Um, you could detect the direction of the motion if you want to do swipes or pushes and things like that. And you can get really fancy if you want. You can even extend this to do some lightweight point tracking. If you need some analog control in some of these cases where uh, ST is not supporting the pose that you need, uh, you can go ahead and try some of this motion-based uh, tracking to maybe get a better result for your experience. That's great, Casey. Thank you so much. So before we wrap up here, I know we're we're out of time. We want to keep uh, keep people who've been tuned in all day, keep them on schedule as much as we can. Uh, there is a poll link at the bottom of the video. If you're watching this live, I'm asking you to please just take a few moments, fill out the poll. Let us know how we did. Let us, you know, let, let us know how I did, how Rob did, how Carmen, Casey, everyone that was here today. Let us know how your experience was. 
were there bandwidth issues? I mean, the whole thing, let us know. It helps us improve. It helps us know what to do better next time. If you, we did things that you really, really liked, wow, we really love to hear that stuff too. So please just take a few moments uh, and, and fill out that poll. That really, really helps us. Uh, also, I thank you for watching. A lot of people have been on with us for now seven hours. Some people stayed up super late. Um, I had a guy tweet me this morning on our way in and he said, wow, I just finished up my day. He was in Europe and I'm now ready for a second full day of this Jumpstart content. So thank you so much for joining us, letting us talk to you. We're super excited about the, the new Connect V2, the sensor and SDK. Thank you to Casey. For, for joining us. This was really great. Absolutely. Thanks, yeah, thanks to all the rest of our speakers. Rob, can you come up here real quick and just kind of say, say goodbye for the day? Bye, guys. There's <laughs> Rob. So again, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the forum and seeing what you create with the new Connect sensor. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys.